AJ, thank you so much for spending um, the next few minutes with me discussing some matters of national importance. I want to first ask you, today we, we had a, um, a hearing of the case re relating to the, G the GTU strike. I know that the AG Chambers had put in a request for an extension of time to submit affidavits in relation to this matter. Can you explain to us what exactly transpired in court today? Thank you, Shukwan. Well, as you would know, the GTU filed an action against the Attorney General claiming a number of reliefs. The action was filed on Friday last, the 16th of February, and served on the Attorney General Chambers Friday afternoon, that is on the 16th in the afternoon. And two sets of proceedings were received. One, an application for two conservatory orders and the substantive action, which is the fixed date application that claims a number of reliefs. Mm. The application for the conservatory orders are interim reliefs that should or should not be granted until the hearing and determination of the principal case, to put it in layman terms, mm. is like an interlocutory application for an injunction while the substantive matter is to be heard and determined. So the two proceedings came together and the application for the conservatory order, orders was fixed for hearing on today's date, that is the 22nd of February. The substantive matter is fixed for hearing on the 3rd of April. Now the rules say the rules of court say that in the event of an interlocutory application of this type, at least 14 days, the day that is fixed for the hearing of the application, must be at least 14 days from the date of filing, and at least 10 days from the date of service. So it was filed and served on the same day. So at least for the hearing of the application, the hearing date should have been on the 16th plus the 14 days that I'm speaking about, right? So that would have taken us to some day in March. And the 10 days, of course, on service. So 10 days from the 16th would have at least taken us to the 26th yeah. of February. So on both counts, the time frames were abridged, putting the respondent, Attorney General, at a disadvantage. So what litigant is permitted to do, litigants are permitted to do in such a case, is to make an application before the case comes up for hearing and ask for an extension of time to answer or to file an affidavit of answer to the application and point out the basis for that application. That was done by the Attorney General in this case. And when such an application is made, it is normally heard at the same time with the notice of application. So the two came up for hearing at the same time. The judge was prepared, obviously, to grant the extension of time. Because there is no difficulty in granting the extension of time because clearly the rules were not observed. And that's the court's fault because they fixed the dates, not the other side. So that was clear. And the judge was very much ready and willing to allow for the extension to be granted. However, if the extension is to be granted, what happens in the interregnum in relation to the conservatory orders? Should they be granted or not? At least until the hearing of this matter. Mm -hmm. We have not even touched the substantive matter yet. 
So the judge asked that question. What should happen if he's to grant the extension? Should the injunction, should the conservatory orders be granted? I said no. The conservatory orders should not be granted. Because there is no case made out for a conservatory order or the two conservatory orders to be granted. A court, in my view, not in my view, the law is that before any order is granted by a court, a case has to be made out for such an order to be granted. Whether it is an interim order, whether it is, it is an interlocutory order, whether it is a permanent order. And I started to present arguments upon the invitation of the court to show neither of these orders should be granted. There were two. One, sought to restrain the government from deducting salaries from the striking teachers. That's the first one. And the second one sought to direct the government to cease the deduction of, cease the decision rather, to deduct union dues from the teachers' wages and salaries, and pay it over to the union. The, because we had made a decision to stop offering the service. And with the permission of the judge, I was allowed to present arguments. And I did so, very lengthy arguments. And I showed very clearly that the law in Guyana and the rest of the Caribbean is that the relationship which exists between public servants <clears throat> and teachers and the government is one of a employee employer relationship and the law is in relation to strike if the employee decides to withhold their labor and strike, a right which they have, a freedom which they have, then the employer is entitled to withhold pay. It's a very simple equation. You bring to the table your labor, and I am required in an employment contract, once I employ you, and you provide that labor, I must pay for it. If you withhold your labor, I am entitled to withhold my pay. That is a simple law that governs the entire Caribbean, including Guyana. And this has come up in many, many cases and have been decided upon. The textbook writers writing the law of employment in the Caribbean have all expressed the consistent and uniform view that that is the law. So if <clears throat> teachers continue to strike, then the employer, who is the government, must continue to have the power to deduct their salaries. So the conservatory order that was being sought to restrain the employer from exercising his power of withholding pay was being suspended by the conservatory order. And that is what I demonstrated to the judge. The court can't order the teachers to go back to school or the, I invited the court to do that. The court declined. On the same token, or by the same token, and on the same principle, you cannot compel me, the employer, to pay for that which I'm not receiving. If it is that you want to conserve, 
as the order suggests, or you want to preserve until the hearing and determination of the matter, then you have to preserve equitably. You have to say, you workers, you can withhold your labor if you wish, and you employer, you can withhold your pay if you wish, if you wish. I was unable to convince the judge that that is the position. The judge felt that if he is to grant, or rather refuse to grant the order or the orders, then he would, ha he would be determining the entire case at the interim stage, a position that I don't agree with, obviously. And the case law authorities say that when you apply for a conservatory order, you have to show an arguable case. You have to show that you have a prima facie case, that you have a serious issue to be determined. And in my view, the law is extraordinarily clear on this issue. No work, no pay. And I believe that it is wrong to order one side to perform their side of the bargain when the other side is not performing their side of the bargain. So I believe that that decision is unfortunate. So that conservatory order, in my view, should not have been granted. Then there's a second conservatory order. That relates to the, the, the deduction of monies from the salaries of the workers by the government and transmitting those deductions to the union. I didn't get an opportunity to argue this point much before the court because the court determined, stop the arguments and said, look, essentially, I am going to grant these orders only to preserve the status quo and I'll bring forward the hearing of the case. And that is what the court eventually did. But let me deal with this argument, for example. First of all, this was a service voluntarily offered by the government. That's the first thing. Government is not being paid for it. The, no one seemed to understand how it arose. It certainly did not arise out of the law. It did not arise out of a contract. But it's there for a number of years. We already have a ruling from both a high court and our court of appeal that the government has no obligation to offer this service or to continue it. That came out in a case in respect of the government withholding this service in respect of public servants. The GPSU had challenged that decision. And the court ruled, look, the government can stop this if they wish. The same way that they voluntarily entered into it, the same way they can voluntary, voluntarily come out of it. And it's not that the unions are going to be affected by not getting their union dues. They will simply have to find another mechanism of doing it. And the case law authorities also support the position of the government terminating it. The issue is, or one of the issues would be, could the government do it without notice? And the case law says yes. The case law uniformly say that no one is bound forever by any practice. No one, and, uh, uh, and, and it is a matter of policy and that a government is free to determine whatever it, the policy is in the absence of law. And if the government decides to change that policy, the government has a right to do so. And to prevent the government 
from changing this policy by, by saying that it can do so or by imposing conditionalities would be an undue fetter on the government's discretion and power to change its policies. And many cases I have reviewed where, for example, prison policies were changed about parole and, and, and etc. And, and there were challenges. And the courts say, look, they can change the policy. They don't have to hear you. Right? And then one has to look also at the conduct of the union. You see, those who come for certain types of protection from the court, for example, legitimate expectation, as it is one of the claim that the union is seeking to establish before the court, that they have a legitimate expectation that this practice will continue. But for how long? You can't legitimately expect me to grant you a favor perpetually. You should be thankful that I did it for so many years. You see, the law is not an abstract. The law is made out of common sense. So, and the law says, I, I can change my policy in particular because of your conduct in relation to that policy. What is the union's conduct in relation to that policy? They were negotiating with the government and midway of those negotiations, they broke it off and they went on a strike. There was an adjourned date for a meeting, etc. Then you have politicians in the strike. Then you have, most importantly, the same money that you are asking me to deduct from the teachers and transmit to you, you are not accounting for it. The laws of Guyana, by virtue of Section 35 of the Trade Union Act, says very clearly that all unions registered under the Act, and the GTU is registered under the Act, must file annual returns. And this is not a sterile exercise, filing annual returns. The annual returns must include a statement of their assets, their liabilities, and their income, and how that income is being spent and accounted for. And that statement must be given to the membership. And anyone who makes a deposit in the union's account, the government certainly is making a deposit in the union's account. They have never served a copy of their annual return to the government. They have not filed it in accordance with the Section 35 of the Trade Unions Act. Section 36 and 37 of the Trade Unions Act say that a failure to file those annual returns constitutes a criminal offense in respect of every member of the union, every executive of the union. So it's a criminal offense. They have not filed since 2004. That's 20 years, two decades. So you expect me to continue to deduct people's monies, deposit it with you, and for 20 years, you are not accounting for it. The union members don't know what you're doing with their money, and in some seven or eight million dollars a month, or whatever it is. Somebody totaled it, they say it's nearly two billion or over two billion dollars. You are not accounting for that. You're not telling the people who you're receiving it from what you're doing with it. Nobody knows. After this matter became public, they have been unable for nearly two weeks now to point to anything that they have done with this money. They have been unable to give a public explanation as to why these annual returns have not been filed. They have been unable to point publicly to any, uh, any 
venture for which they have used this money. And you want me to continue to deduct this money and transmit it to you. And I am the government. I'm not no private party. I owe a duty to act responsibly and accountably and transparently. I have obligations in law to do so. So on what basis I am being ordered to continue this relationship? So as I said, I didn't get to go into that particular argument in the way that I'm doing it here, but I'll do it when, once I'm given the opportunity to do so. But the two conservatory orders were granted. And the judge brought forward the substantive action. I suppose recognizing the serious legal implications. The judge felt, and he repeated it over and over again, that if he were to refuse the two orders that were being asked of him, then he would have been disposing of the entire case in, these, in this application. In other words, there would have been nothing to be granted in the end. And I don't share that view. If orders are not to be granted, in accordance with the law, then they, they are not to be granted. The thing is that if the government deducts these monies wrongfully and it is subsequently found out or the court rules that the deductions were unlawful, then the government obviously has the capacity to Repay it. But look at the reverse. If the teachers receive money and it is found that those monies were unlawfully received, then the teachers will have to pay it back. How are they going to pay it back? They're not going to deposit back money. It's the government again that will have to now do accumulated deductions. The union Jews. That is even more problematic. If the union Jews are deducted and transmitted to the union, remember there are now teachers who do not want their union Jews to be deducted anymore. A lot of people didn't know this. This strike and this revelation brought a lot of knowledge to people's attention. There are many, many teachers now who feel that this union is not acting in their best interest, do not want to contribute to this. But you're now going to deduct their monies because if the government is allowed to sever this relationship, then these teachers will now have to voluntarily go to the union. Right? But, and, 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 and if now that the government has to deduct, then these people will lose their money. You follow me? Yeah, yeah. How the union is not going to give back the government the money. So you had those countervailing and prevailing factors that I believe ought to have aggregate to persuade the judge not to grant, but I was unable to persuade the judge. But as I said, the matter has been brought forward now because this, these, the grant of these conservatory orders disposes of this aspect of the proceedings. What is left now is a substantive act action. Hopefully, I am able to persuade the judge that the deduction from the salary is lawful, and those deductions will then have to be made. And secondly, that the government should be allowed to continue its decision of refusing
to deduct these Union Jews. Recall his decision has already been made. That's another part of the problem with the judge's order. The judge's order seeks to restrain the government from doing something that has already been done. The government has already severed the agency arrangement. But we'll have to deal with that eventuality. AG, I wanted to ask you, what impact do you think this will have going forward on this strike? Do you see an, an emboldening now of the GTU to continue in its, in, in, in its attitude towards this issue as a result of this, this order? I can't speak for the GTU. What I can tell you is that it should not have such an impact. The president of the GTU was present in the court, and he's an intelligent man. He heard the law. So there may be a postponement of the inevitable. Right? But the law is the law. It won't change. The case will be the date for the hearing of the substantive case is the 20th of March, which is less than a month away. The law will not change from now to March. So what has been adjourned will eventually come down on the 20th of March. So this is only, a, in my view, a very temporary reprieve. Because I'm convinced. And I, and I believe, well, I believe it. I'm convinced that the law is that the employer can withhold salary. Anybody, you ask any person who has read the law, and they will tell you that that is the law. And it's not only the law in Guyana. I, re I relied on Jamaican cases. I relied on cases from Dominica and other countries in the Eastern Caribbean. We relied on cases in England, which we received the law from. And in relation to the Union Jews, we already have our Court of Appeal ruling on that matter. The only issue now that is left to be determined is should they have been given notice? Well, from the time we made the decision to now they have notice. <laughs> so that, that argument cures itself. So all that has happened is a temporary reprieve from what I believe will be the inevitable. But that doesn't solve the problem. The government's position is not to be fighting with teachers. I am hoping that good sense will prevail and that the teachers will go back into the classrooms because and, and, and resume work. That, that, we, we are in the business of governing the country for the betterment of the country. The teachers striking is not helping that situation is not a, a positive factor in that equation. So I hope that the matter can be resolved. But that's the industrial side of the matter. These legal issues have to be clarified. And I would want the court to determine this case. Whether the teachers go back or not, that's a different issue. I am hoping that they would. And that matter can resolve itself. But for future, because there's a lot of misconceptions here in Guyana. And I, I've, I've seen it. I mean, I've researched the law, we have argued the position, and a lot of people are laboring under all manner of misapprehensions of what the law is and about right to strike and about constitutional right to property and about right to be heard and... And these fanciful, well, not fanciful, important concepts are being completely confused and imported into an arena where they have no place. And hopefully this can set the precedent. This matter, I hope, will clarify the law going forward. So in the future, both parties, the strikers as well as the employers, whoever they are, will have a clear understanding of what their powers are what their duties are, what their responsibilities are, and what the law is on all these industrial issues. And all these utopian concepts 
about freedoms and the constitutional rights and so on will be put in their proper space and perspective. Angie, thank you so much for spending some time discussing this issue with us. Today. You're welcome. I hope that I have clarified the matter yeah. for the press too because I see all sorts of uh, misleading headlines and misleading stories on this matter. I hope that I have brought some clarity. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Eiji, thank you so much for spending um, the next few minutes with me discussing some matters of national importance. I want to first ask you, today we, we had a, um, a hearing of the case re relating to the, G the GTU strike.